We are live. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are really excited because right now we're joined by seven classes from across North America. We might get one more in a minute, so I want to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. We've got Miss Reeves, grade fours in Leamington in Ontario. Hi, guys. Hey, welcome in. I don't know what the puppet is, but I love it. We've got Miss Liz's grade nines in Homestead in Florida. Hi, guys. Hey, you're so loud. You like broke the mic and your computer with that. That's awesome. We've got Mr. Soretsky, grade fours in Wadena in Saskatchewan. Hi, guys. Hey, everyone. Hey, welcome in. We've got Miss Maritzen's grade nine through 11s in Riverside, Illinois. If they've made it to class by now, let's see. Oh, <laughs> do they not have chairs in Illinois? What's going on? I like that you're all on the floor. Awesome. Okay, we'll have to figure that out later. <laughs> We've got Miss Mass grade fours and fives in Brooklyn in New York. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey, Hi. nice. See, those are the chairs that the Illinois class needs. There we go. <laughs> and last but not least, we've got Miss Nielsen's grade threes in Freehold in New Jersey. Hi, guys. Hi. Welcome in. Hey, there we are. There's so many of you. Awesome. All right. Of course, the reason you guys are all here with us today is for our speaker. So we are joined live at the Gothic Mansion of the Explorers Club headquarters in beautiful New York City by Brianna Rowe. So she's joined us a few times uh, with a partner organization called Reach the World. She's one of the leads there in bringing amazing stories of expeditions and exploration to kids all around the world. But today she's going to talk about an expedition of her own to the Cano Cristales, and I think I'm pronouncing that right, uh, expedition to Colombia, to the one of the most unique and amazing river ecosystems in the world. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Brianna. Thank you so, so much for joining us today and take it away. Hi, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all the classrooms join. Um, so like Jesse said, my name is Brianna Rowe. I am an explorer. Um, I also work at Reach the World, which is a nonprofit dedicated to inspiring kids to explore. Um, I am also a filmmaker and I've led expeditions for kids in different parts of the world. And I've had some amazing jobs in my life so far. I've worked on projects in the Arctic. I've researched elephants in Thailand and East Africa. And I've had a lot of opportunities to go on expedition. And I'm here right now at the Explorers Club. So you can kind of see it's really dark in here. And you can see these, these things behind me. These are Explorers Club flags. Now the Explorers Club is a big mansion in the Upper East Side of New York City. You can kind of hear some sirens going outside here in New York City. Um, this is a clubhouse for all different kinds of explorers and researchers to get together and meet up and discuss expeditions. Oh, you can hear it. <laughs> talk, about, talk about different places that they want to explore, talk about new research, new findings, new tools to go out and explore the world. And I've met a lot of phenomenal people here at the Explorers Club. And the first thing that you do as an Explorers Club member and you're planning an expedition is you can apply to take one of these flags on your expedition. And there are just under 200 flags um, that are in circulation that you can apply to take on an expedition. And these flags have a rich history because some of them have gone to the top of Mariana, or the top of Mount Everest and the bottom of Mariana's Trench, the top is part in the, the highest part in the world and the lowest part in the world. So when you carry a flag, you're not only bringing a piece of the Explorers Club, but you're bringing a piece of history of exploration on your expedition. So in 2000, I'm gonna tell you guys about an expedition that I did with my father in 2017. And um, my dad is a filmmaker. So I was lucky enough to grow up in Toronto, Ontario, Canada with a dad who went on expedition for his job. He made films about unique parts of the world. And I got to go with him, so it was really lucky. And um, in 2016, we heard that this one area of Colombia was safe to travel to because um, of an agreement. Colombia has a, a long history of conflict and there's one part of Colombia that we were always looking to go to. 
called the Red River, Caño Cristales. It's an area unique to the world that where the river turns red. And it wasn't that well documented at the time and we didn't know that much about it. And we wanted to go down there and take photos. Uh, my dad is a filmmaker and he was working on a project called Red Planet. And it's about all the red things in the world, um, in our earth. And so he had gone to a lot of different areas to film lava and uh, red rocks. And he really wanted to film this red river. And so in 2016, uh, we heard that the, that the president and the United Nations were working on a peace agreement um, to have a ceasefire agreement. That means that in this region of Colombia, where, which was controlled by the rebel group FARC, um, they, they created an, an agreement that said that they were going to cease fire. They were not going to have any conflict. And so we learned about this and we said, okay, it's time to go down to Colombia. It's safe to go there for us. And we can go deep into the jungle and film this amazing Red River. Um, so that's how it all started. And um, I'm going to show you a few pictures right now of, um, let's see if we can share my screen. Um, these are some of the photos that we took when we went down there. And then I'm going to uh, show a little video about, um, about the Red River and about our journey. So let's see if we can start that here. Share. Okay. Can you guys see that? Yep, you're perfect. Okay. Let me see if I can move. Um, Okay, so um, this, you guys see this, this really cool picture, huh? So this is the unique Red River. It's located in the Amazon jungle of Colombia. And the river is a meeting point of three unique ecosystems. Um, you've got the plain regions, you've got the Amazon rainforest, and then you've got um, the mountain range from the Andean mountains coming in. So it's this really unique spot. And it's the only environment in the world where um, a small plant grows called Macarena claviera. It's, it's a little hard to pronounce, that's the Latin word for it. And this is a red plant that grows out of the bedrock and it fixes itself to the stones. It's a river, river weed and it grows out of the bottom of the rock there. And then the, the water is crystal clear on top um, because it does not have a lot of nutrients in it. So the water is really clear and it's really shallow. And then right underneath, you see this beautiful red plant. Um, so this, this uh, river is called the, ri the Red River or the Rainbow River or the River of Five Colors. So you can see the different colors there. Um, people have been known to say that it, it's yellow, blue, green, red, and black. So the yellow you can see there pretty clearly and that's from the plant that's starting to change color. Um, the blue is from the reflection um, of the sky and the water that turns blue. Green is also when the plant first starts to grow, it's just a little um, bud and, it, and it's green to begin with. And then it turns this vibrant red color, as you can see. And then um, also the, the bedrock is black. So you'll get hints of black in there as well. People have also called it pink and purple and you can really see all these different colors there as well. And that's me and my dad there. We're carrying an Explorers Club flag. This is flag number 97 that we got to take on us on expedition. And so it was really amazing for us to be able to get to go down there and to, to show off the Explorers Club flag um, and to take it to this new destination. Um, the river here has a lot, it's, it's, a, it's a narrow river that has a lot of waterfalls and rapids and streams and these whirlpools. And so it's a really unique um, environment here. And the redness of the river grows between uh, June and November. So we went right in November when the whole thing was in full bloom, it was really beautiful. And I'm gonna see if I can show you guys, take a look when I play this video, um, see if you can understand this plant, this river weed that's growing and how it's attaching itself um, to the bedrock here. <laughs> Thank you. 
So it's, it's a really cool, um, really cool plant. And it's um, one of the things we were also studying when we were there were the, the threats to this plant. So I'll talk about that in a little second, but how about I play the video here that we created after the expedition. So let's get started here. For the past 10 years, my father's been traveling the world, chronicling all the red spots on earth for a project called Red Planet. He shot photos in Hawaii, Indonesia, Utah, India, Italy, and Iceland. This time, I'm joining him to Keno Cristalis, an amazing river that is considered one of the most beautiful in the world. He applied to the Explorers Club to carry one of their flags on the expedition, and we received flag number 97 at the annual Old Pumps Ward Dinner. The river is deep in the Amazon jungles of Colombia. Until only a few years ago, the area was off limits, caught up in the Colombian Civil War, and controlled by the FARC Revolutionary Group. After the charter flight to the town of La Macarena, we boarded fast, narrow riverboats and headed up the Guillavera River towards the Cano Cristales. From there, long off-road drive on 4 by 4s Then, a long hike through the jungle with our guide and translator. Finally, we make it to the river and it is an extraordinary sight. Our timing has been good. The water levels are up and the plant that colors the river red is in full bloom. I set up a vegan satellite unit and connect live with students across North America to tell them about the unique environment. It was really important for the red planet because take a look, it's a completely red river. We're also taking a look to see how climate change might be affecting the river. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The biggest, biggest threat for the Red River right now is actually oil. There is an oil company that set up shop close by that is interested in extracting oil from the soil here. Hopefully, the images can help protect this fragile environment. At the break of dawn on the last day of our expedition, a local adventurer takes us up the river to El Mirador Mountain. It is a steep, wet, and difficult climb. But at the top, just discovered pre-Columbian rock art and painted in red ochre. An unexpected discovery, but perfect for Red Planet. All right. So that was great. That was the most meta exploring by the seat of your pants presentation aspect ever. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we got really lucky and we, you know, on our last day, we got to keep going and keep exploring this region, which hadn't been really, you know, explored by a lot of tourists or um, a lot of um, researchers and we found these amazing cave paintings that were also red so we could add it to our uh, red planet book series um, so that was really amazing but you know one of the one of the reasons we went down there and one of the dilemmas I always have about going to a new place and you know taking photos and sharing this information with the world um, is that it, it becomes a new destination that people want to go to. So even in the last couple of years, since uh, we went to Kenya Cristales, it's been publicized a lot. It's becoming more and more of a tourist spot. And I think in the video there, I mentioned that um, an oil company was, was setting up shop nearby and that was a big threat to the river. If um, big business was gonna come in and maybe have some dumping or um, really not take care of that environment. And it turns out that the government actually invested um, a little bit of money into preserving the park, um, into creating it, you know, uh, into creating ecotourism around the area so that um, the money that is coming in from people wanting to see this area goes back into preserving it. And it was actually closed this last season because they were setting up bridges and other um, infrastructure in order to bring tourists to the area. 
Um, so ecotourism is a way to conserve an area if people care a lot about it and, and if people will pay a lot of money to go down there and see it as, as this pristine, beautiful um, area, then um, it's one way of, of doing conservation. Um, but the but the region, you know, this is a really fragile um, area, and it's a really unique area. And things like climate change, um, having an intense, really hot summer that could dry up the the narrow river, or increase deforestation, or increase burning of the Amazon River or of the Amazon, um, or you know, over tourism, having too many people there who are wearing sunscreen and it's rubbing off, and the toxins. Um, are creating a problem to the river. All of these things are um, threats to the Red River. So um, it's worth sort of thinking about how do we conserve this really unique space and this amazing unique plant that grows there. Yeah, fantastic, Brianna. Um, I don't know if you, I mean, you're, you're really early into this presentation. If there's anything else from that expedition or anything of your other expeditions that you'd like to share, you can. Otherwise, we'll dive in with questions and then maybe get to that uh, those aspects in a little bit. Does that sound good? Yeah, sure. Sounds good. Awesome. So we've got a few groups watching on YouTube as well. So we're going to uh, see if they have any questions. You can type them in the chat bar and I'll pass them straight along. Uh, but yeah, seven classes live. So let me start with Miss Reeves' group. We'll come to you guys first and we'll go from there. Come on up, guys. Any questions? Yeah, come on up to the camera. <laughs> Uh, what it is, um, how many places have you visited? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a really great question. So I started um, my journey really in, in high school. I started applying to grants and programs that um, really got you out into the field. And the first one that I went to was at the um, Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, um, I was really obsessed with dolphins and I wanted to study dolphins and all these underwater creatures. So when I was 15, I applied to go on a program there. And that was the first place that I went on my own um, to do research. And since then, I lived in East Africa for six months on a research program as well. I lived in Hong Kong uh, for, for three months on a research program. Um, I went to the Arctic a couple years ago, um, up in the Canadian Arctic and over to Greenland um, on a, a research expedition. I've climbed volcanoes in Indonesia on a filmmaking expedition. I've also done volcanoes in uh, Guatemala on another filmmaking trip. Um, I've also taken, I've done three different flag expeditions. So a flag expedition is a really special expedition where you get to carry one of these flags and you're contributing new knowledge to the world of science and exploration. And uh, the first one that I went on was a um, research expedition to Cape Eleuthera in the Bahamas and we were looking at lionfish. Lionfish is a species that um, is traditionally found in the Indian Ocean and it turns out that lionfish are all over the Caribbean. And when we went there in 2011, we were looking at what is the impact gonna be of these new, of, of these lionfish, which they don't have any species that, that would normally eat them. So they were just expanding and growing and growing and eating a lot of the other species. And um, so we were with a team out there to say, what is gonna happen to the Caribbean uh, with these lionfish? So that was a really exciting one. Uh, another one was a submarine dive into um, an area called uh, Curacao. And we were looking at new fish species. And so we took the submarine all the way down, I think 650 feet underwater. When we got underwater, we had this amazing cool submarine and it had two arms. And the first arm would shoot a little bit of anesthetic, a little bit of, um, little bit of, of fluid that would make fish really loopy. And so they'd sort of slow down and they would uh, kind of calm down. And then the second arm would suck up the fish and we would decompress these fish um, because if you brought it right up to the surface, it, would, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't survive because these fish, there's so much pressure at 650 feet 
under the ocean. So you have to bring it up slowly and let it, let it chill out at 400 feet and let it chill out at 200 feet. And so after a few weeks, you can bring it up to the top and you study these different fish species. Yeah. So that was an, another um, flag expedition that I did. Mm -hmm. And then the, the most recent one was to Canyon Cristalis. By the way, for our classes too, we've got, uh, you guys sort of saw a video of it within the video, uh, but we have Rihanna's Keno Cristalis when she was live there, video on our Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants channel, and an amazing one from Cambodia, where in the middle of the night, they were talking about protecting soft shell turtles, which is really cool. We're gonna be talking about that in February as well. Um, fantastic, Brianna. You need to get off the couch more, obviously. Um, that was a great uh, group of expeditions. All right, let's go to our next class, Ms. Liz's class. If you guys wanna come up, go for it. How does global warming affect the ribbon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a really big question. And that's something that I study because global warming and climate change is really everything. It's really, it's, it's, there's the science behind it, but then there's also the policy behind it. And um, so I look at, like, I look at the, the impacts of climate change and um, what are some of the things that like society can do to, to, um, try to mitigate those problems. I think the biggest threats though, um, is the idea that, um, the, that the river would dry up. So as the war, as the world gets warmer, the, the river would dry up. The other impact could be, we don't know what would happen to this plant if the river changed temperature. So if the river becomes too hot or becomes, um, uh, you know, if it, if it just changes the uh, salinity, for example, we don't know how that's going to affect this plant. Um, another big, big thing is that this area is uh, in the Amazon rainforest, and you guys have probably heard the destruction of the Amazon rainforest, both from deforestation from humans doing logging, but also just how climate change is impacting um, and increasing forest fires in the area. And, how, and if, if there was a forest fire in the area, it would completely change um, the landscape of, um, this, uh, of this Red River. Um, and then of course, you know, just the impact of oil and drilling and other extraction companies. Um, Colombia is an incredibly um, fertile and rich land. And as humans um, develop into it and we extract more resources um, and we mine for different things, we're gonna be drastically changing the landscape of the land. And so that's gonna have um, a really huge impact on, um, on the river. Yeah, excellent. I'm glad we got that question so early. All right, uh, Mr. Suretsky's class, come on up guys. You guys have a question. Uh, why is the why is the red plants in the red river? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a river weed that really only grows in this one part of Colombia. Um, the reason it grows there is because of a lot of different factors in the environment in the landscape there. Uh, we have, like I mentioned, there's this plain region. So you guys know the plains and mountain ranges, and then also the rainforest. And so it's very rare that these three ecosystems sort of meet, but they kind of meet at this one point in, um, in Colombia. Um, and that's where this, this plant grows. So, you know, there's a lot of new, there's a lot of species of things out there. And I think the red plant was so exciting to see because it's so dramatic and it's so drastic. And, but there's a lot of different species of plants and animals that we haven't even discovered yet. And so finding this red one, you know, it's been, people have been around it and people have known about it for a long time, but it's just a really special one to me because it's so dramatic um, with this Red River. Very cool, thanks so much. All right, uh, let's go to Ms. Maritzen's class. You guys have one, come on up. Uh so uh, is there any other countries that you've wanted to travel to but necessarily couldn't because of conflicts in that country? Yeah, good question. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, it happens all the time, actually. Um, when I was, I was living in East Africa for um, about six months and 
you know, I was only about, I was 20 years old and my parents were a bit nervous to send me off there. And my plan afterward was to go to Egypt and to go see the pyramids and to look at uh, the amazing culture and history in Egypt. And it was right around the time of the Arab Spring, which is um, when a lot of countries in North Africa um, and the Middle East were um, having revolutions. And it actually was a lot of social media was propelling these revolutions. And I really wanted to go to Egypt. I had a plane ticket there, but I had to cancel because um, it was uh, it was just not the right time to go to Egypt for me. Uh, there was a lot of uh, potential dangers with uh, protests and uprisings um, in, in the region. So I still haven't made it back to Egypt. Um, the thing with, with Colombia though is, you know, it is, it is a safe place to travel to. And I have done a lot of different courses on risk management to learn um, what the conflicts are ahead of time. You really have to research what's going on, what are your dangers when you go into a new place where, you, um, where you're not from. And so you have to do a lot of research. Um, in Colombia, you know, there, the cities are, are safe and they're safe for tourists to go to. And um, I would even say that the Red River is, is a safe place to go to, but you just have to really be aware of your, um, of the histories of the places that you're going to and the potential conflicts when you're going there. Yeah, that's a good lesson to apply to anywhere that you're going in the world. And it's a question we don't get very often. So I'm really glad I got brought up in this one. So thanks guys. Um, all right, Miss Mess class, come on up. You guys have one. Yeah. Who wants to ask a question? Sorry, no, no question. Adriel, Ethan, oh, Tahina, yeah. come on up. Uh, have a question? Come up yeah. to the camera, come on. Don't be shy, all good. <laughs> come on, Tahina. Even if we did bite, we can't do it through the computer, so it's okay. Come on, come on. you do this all the time. Wait, can I do it? Oh, boy. Come on. So I'm going to come back to you guys in a second, okay? If you have a question in a second, and I'll come back. Uh, I'm going to go to Miss Nielsen's class first, and then if you think of it, and if you're comfortable asking by then, that's all good. So Miss Nielsen's class, come on up, guys. Yep, yeah, you're good. Go um, ahead. You can scoot down a little bit. <laughs> Was, did you take an, a sample of the plants? Yeah. yeah, thank you for asking that question. It's a really great question. Um, we were not allowed to touch the plants. And I really love this policy that you cannot touch the plants. Um, there, there, we had to do actually an entire training course um, from the government of Colombia and um, the environmental department there put together, um, you know, they, they sat down with us and they said, you cannot bring sunscreen into um, our, into the river. You cannot touch the plants. You cannot step on the plants. And so there were a lot of rules that they put forward because they're really, you know, the, they're really nervous that um, too much, uh, too many people disrupting uh, these plants would, would be a problem for their survival. So we were not allowed to touch them. In order to do that kind of research, you often have to uh, apply for permits from the government. So nowadays in most, most countries, Everywhere you go, you have to do your research into um, what the policies are of the different governments, and you have to apply for permits. Um, even a lot of times when you're filming in, in other countries, you have to apply for permits in order to um, actually film there, and in, even sometimes to ask people questions. Um, so that in order to do research properly, you have to get your permits. Um, and we did not apply to, to take a sample of, um, of the plant. Yeah. Now, you had said earlier, just a quick follow-up on that, that ecotourism is an option that works in a lot of places in the world. Now, if this area is that delicate that you needed to go through all this training, is ecotourism a viable option? Is this something where people could come in and explore it, or is that not likely to happen because of this uh, delicacy? Mm -hmm. It's a tricky question, and we don't really know the answer. And right now, you know, ecotourism seems to be one of the best options for conservation um, because there are so many policies and rules that you can put into place um, on a space 
when you are making it an ecotourism destination. When we went there, there was only about, you know, 30 different um, sort of there postings of ways to get into the park of people that you can talk to to get into the park. Um, now there's like more than 500 operators. And so ecotourism is not like a final answer. It's something that needs to be worked on all the time. And, and it costs a lot of money in order to do ecotourism right. So um, in my opinion, I think that it's, it's the best option for this area. Um, you're going to have more people coming to this region. Um, the, the world is becoming a smaller and smaller place. And so I think it's a smart idea to set up ecotourism properly and to get tourists on board with conserving the environment in the places that they go to. Fantastic. All right. I'm going to go back to Brooklyn. Uh, if you guys have a question, if you're comfortable asking now, come on up and Ms. Mess. Yeah. Yeah. Can you drink that water? Can you drink the water? <laughs> Can you drink the water? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I mean, probably the water is pretty safe to drink. It's a really, <laughs> um, it's a really, a uh, unique part of the world where it, there's not a lot of human activities, but I never suggest going off and drinking the water. We bring with us uh, water filtration kits. And so there are these uh, water bottles. They look just like your you know, water bottle, um, but they have a little filter in them. And so and if we are ever out there stranded and we can't get water, uh, we can filter the river water and I would always recommend to filter your river water yeah. um, and always drink plenty of water. I actually have a story when I, I didn't even tell you this one, Jesse, but when I was doing um, the video call with kids and I was Skyping into um, classrooms from the river, I spent all day hiking. It was all morning hiking. And I was so nervous about our call that I actually um, got a little, I, got, I didn't drink enough water. And when you're out there in the field and you don't drink enough water, you can start to get a little lightheaded. And so I, it's always important to drink a lot of water when you're out there in the field. And it's always important to drink safe drinking water when you're out there. Yeah. Otherwise you could, you know, fall or collapse or anything else. We, every explorer that uh, has ever done one of these sessions with us has a story of drinking bad water. So it's something to really keep in mind uh, when you go anywhere. Awesome. Well, thanks for the story, Brianna. We're whipping through these, so let's let's see how many we can do in another round. I'm gonna go to Miss Reed's class first, who has like all their students standing up at the ready. Oh, well, they did for a second there. <laughs> Come on up, guys. How many animals are there in the lake? Say it again. Yeah. How many animals are there in the lake? Yeah. Mm hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, the river is really narrow and really shallow, so there's not a whole lot of animals there, um, but there are little fish species that we saw um, floating around. It was a freshwater river. Um, but what we learned is, you know, Colombia is an incredibly biodiverse region. Um, we were told it has the most bird species um, in the world in that area of, of Colombia. So we saw tons of birds. Um, we took a lot of different rivers to get to the Kenyo Cristales River. And in one of them, they said that there were pink dolphins. So I was on, on the lookout for pink dolphins, but I didn't actually get to see any. Uh, there's a lot of monkeys that we saw on our route, um, but in this, this particular river, there actually, the reason it's so clear is because there's not a lot of nutrients in the water. And that's actually why this plant can kind of grow and take over um, because it doesn't need a lot of nutrients to survive. That's why we call it a river weed. And so there's not a whole lot of other, um, it, the river itself is not that biodiverse, but the, the area of Colombia had tons of birds and mammals and dolphins and a lot of other species. Butter, neon butterflies is very cool. Fantastic. All right. Uh, Miss Liz's class, come on back up, guys. Okay, so um, we've noticed that you <laughs> You've done a lot of research and I just wanted to know what really motivated you to study other places. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, and I love being here at the Explorers Club because everybody here at the Explorers Club, there's people from all around the world 
And we all have sort of the same motivation and the same mission, which is that, you know, we really don't know that much about our world. There's so many questions that people don't have answers to. And this group of people here at the Explorers Club are working on those answers. So I love these big questions. And some of them are, you know, really simple and small, like what are the threats to this Red River? Um, but some of them are really big, like is there life in outer space? There are people at the Explorers Club working on those questions. Um, another one that we're talking about, is there, what, is there life at the bottom of our oceans? We don't really know uh, what the answer is to, to what exists down at the bottom of our oceans. So those are some of the really big questions that people are asking. And I love to be part of this exploration community where we're right on the forefront of answering these amazing, huge questions about our earth and our history. Super cool, what a great answer, Brianna. I also wanna note uh, both the Miss Liz's class and Miss Maritzen's class, I can speak English, um, really thoughtful and great questions from high schoolers today, which is unusual. So I really, really appreciate that and you guys being so enthused and engaged, it's awesome. Um, let's go back to Mr. Soretsky's class. If you guys have a question for now, come on up. Are the plants sticky? <laughs> yeah. It's it's a good question because they, they grow out of the bedrock, right? And you saw the, the video of the plants kind of floating there. These are incredible plants that they can latch on to the rock and there's river water flowing through them. There is waterfalls and these plants still are grasping onto the rocks and they're growing out. They're not sticky. They just have really strong uh, roots that can, um, attach themselves to these rocks. Yeah. So uh, now they're not sticky themselves. They're, they look like a normal plant, but they're just really strong. Very cool. Now, nothing's quite as cool as these plants, of course, but I really encourage the class of like, go out, check a stream, check a pond, check these ecosystems. Like there's some really fantastic life that you can find in your backyard that, you know, it's very cool to travel halfway across the world and explore for this sort of thing, but get a chance to do that and it'll inspire more of this sort of adventure. All right, uh, I had said Ms. Maritzen's class a second ago, so let's go back to them. Come on back up, guys. Has there been a specific um, expedition that you have gone on that you've been utterly shocked at the amount of human impact that's already occurred? Yeah. An expedition that I've gone on. That you've been shocked at the amount of human impact. Like when you've gone, you've been astonished by how much garbage or how much uh, destruction or whatever that has mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. Um, I think one of the, hmm, let me think, there's, um, I would say the going to the Arctic was, was pretty cool because I actually, it felt like humans really weren't there. It felt like, um, you know, human destruction hasn't really taken, taken over there in some of the other regions I've been to. Um, we were, I guess last year around this time, we were in, uh, um, along the Mekong River in Colombia, or in Cambodia, sorry. And um, we were actually researching microplastics in the river to see um, what the impact is of uh, humans on the Mekong River. It's the, I think the third largest river in the world. And um, it's getting a lot of, of flow from China and a lot of other countries um, and it's reaching uh, the garbage and the microplastics in the water is actually reaching these small rural villages uh, that we visited. And so we were testing the water sample, we were sampling the water there and looking for microplastics. And um, it was, you know, it was shocking to see the amount of human impact in the river water that you actually couldn't see. You needed a microscope to see the impact of this plastic. So, which means it probably is not coming from the people there. It's probably coming from upstream um, from other countries. So it was pretty devastating to see that the impact on those local people. Yeah. Uh, in September, we do an entire month dedicated to ocean plastics. And so you talk to any of the researchers there and you've seen the amount of trash people see in the most remote places in the world is astonishing. So this is something that we're, you know, human impact is, is everywhere. Great question, guys. 
Um, all right, this will teach me not to write uh, a class on a different box when I start out the thing. We have Mrs. Fram's class joining us, grade fives in Rochester, Minnesota, and I'm so sorry to introduce them at the beginning, but we're gonna take two questions from them back to back. Uh, so Ms. Fram's class, come on up guys, if you have one, go for it. Yep, <laughs> Cleary's coming up, the camera's right there. Go up, go up, go up, go up, go up. What was your favorite flag expedition? Ooh. Ooh. No pressure. My favorite one that I did or favorite one that exists in the world? That you did, yeah. That I did? Oh, I think going down in a submarine is probably the coolest thing I've ever done in, the, in my entire life. Um, and I was a little nervous though, because we all watched the TV show, or we, have we all seen the movie Finding Nemo? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's pretty sad because the, you know, the, the fish was taken out from their family. And, uh, <laughs> and so I was a little upset about the fact that we were take, I didn't know how, how to feel about the fact that we were taking these animals out of their natural environment to study them. And um, I don't know how I, how I even feel about it today. So um, it was the coolest expedition that I've been on going down in the submarine. Um, but I don't think that that's the best it's the, the best way at the time that we could do the science was to disrupt the environment like that, but I don't really agree with it anymore. And I think there needs to be new methods of, obs of observation in order to do scientific research where you're not disrupting um, the environment. Well, I mean, the way that science has been done in all fields, archaeology, zoology, collecting animals for zoos, I mean, this has all changed radically, not just in the last 50 years, but in the lifetimes of the kids that are watching now. So it, it's a, a lot's changing. And, and no matter what, on a plus note, you got to go down in a submarine, which for the class who might not know, maybe a few thousand people in history, maybe have been able to do that. So it's a really exciting opportunity and, and kudos to you. <laughs> All right, right back to Ms. Fram's class. Come on up and then we'll take two more before we wrap up. Okay, so let's go ahead. How many countries have you traveled to? Mm. Mm. That's a good question. Um, I, I used to count. <laughs> And I, I stopped counting. I haven't actually been to that many. There's a lot of countries out there. And usually when I go and do research somewhere, I stay in one area for a long time um, in order to get to know it better. So I think probably about 40 countries. And some of them you're just flying through and you're only there for a day. So I don't think they really count. Um, but I've been on probably about 15 expeditions where the goal has not just been to travel the goal has been to collect information yeah. and distribute it well that is a, a large amount of countries by any measure and, and very very cool and we can all aspire to exploring as much as you have awesome questions guys all right i'm going to take two more miss mess class if you guys want to do another one and i'll come back to miss nielsen's to wrap us up go ahead ethan quick come on say your question do you ever got your permit to touch the plant mm. oh. That's a good question. Um, no, I didn't need to. I, my goals there were not really to touch the plant. Um, I think if I was a, a biologist or a scientist who wanted to do research on the plant, um, then I would have got that, that permit. But, um, but I did not. No. Next time. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ms. Nielsen's class. Come on, wrap us up, guys. Yeah. Ready, Graham? Nice and loud, How does the Rainbow River get its colors? Yeah. Yeah, how does the Rainbow River get its colors? Um, well, the plant starts to grow in about June. And so right now, if you went down there, it would just look like a normal river. But in around June, the, the buds start to come out and it starts to get a little green. And then it and then the plant, you know how plants change color throughout the seasons for you guys? This plant changes color throughout its season of life, which starts in June and it ends in November. And we had to time it really perfectly. And we were, you know, calling our friends and saying, Is, has there been a lot of rain? How's the plant doing? Because it changes color. And we didn't want to go down there when it was yellow. We wanted to go down there when it was bright red. And just like in, I guess for most people in autumn is when the leaves turn red. Um, in around November was when uh, it was gonna be the brightest that this plant was going to be. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Brianna. Um, and as I said to the classes, check out the Keno Cristalis uh, expedition video on our Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants channel and see what happens when you don't drink enough water before a presentation. Um, and before we wrap up, Brianna, is there anything you want to share with class about what they can do to learn more about the Explorers Club, learn more about Reach the World? We can pass them to the sites uh, directly, but anything you want to share? Yeah, yeah. There's so many different ways to find information and to get involved with this exploration community. So um, feel free to message Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants or message me uh, at Brianna at reachtheworld.org. You can go to reachtheworld.org and learn more about um, different expeditions to follow. We have so many different kinds that you can follow. Um, you can do that on your own time or our classrooms can sign up to follow different expeditions. So please do not hesitate to contact me uh, to learn more about that. And if you are ever in New York City, you have to come up to uh, 46 East 70th Street. It's this amazing clubhouse with um, the whole history of exploration. Uh, the club started in 1904 uh, with a bunch of polar explorers. And the mission here is to bring people together who all love exploration. So if you want to go out and be a researcher or an explorer in the future, um, make sure to pop by the Explorers Club or find us online and follow a bunch of um, different expeditions around the world and just keep learning about it. Amazing. And I'll pass along all those resources to our class when we're done. Brianna, you know the drill. At the end of every session, I'm going to demute everyone's microphones in a second. So boys and girls, if you guys can get ready to join me in saying a huge thank you to Brianna, you are all now demuted or should be demuted and can go right ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome, guys. <laughs> All right, uh, to all our teachers, thanks so much for joining us. Again, check out February, an entire month dedicated to amazing women in science like Brianna. Um, Brianna, thank you so, so much for joining. That was fantastic. Yeah, great. Thank you guys so much for having me. Enjoy the rest of your day.